As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. We all go a little mad sometimes. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. You just gotta keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. I love the smell of my pump in the morning. Time has finally come for the 2024 Academy Awards, covering the films from the film year of 2023. This was an absolutely stacked year. I know I, in the beginning, had some criticisms about the year as a whole, but as a lot of the foreign films have come over and the month of December, where we had a great flood of great films being released, this year turned out to be an absolutely phenomenal film year. And we really are on a great hot streak if you just subtract 2020 with 2019, 2021, and 2022 being phenomenal film years in 2023, absolutely continued that trend. So we're going to be ranking the Best Picture nominees this year and also covering the three films we have left to cover, which is the insanely overhated and absolutely not Oscar bait because it's a great film maestro, along with Anatomy of a Fall and American Fiction. But to start us off, we're going to play a game. We're going to do a collaborative ranking of the Best Picture nominees. Some of these we agree on and are very much on the same page, and some of them we do not agree so much. So let's get right into it. Ryan, let's spin the wheel, and let's see Let's see yep. what the yep. order will be. Going to spin a wheel to see who gets to go first. So this is for picking the, the very bottom place, number 10. But this also gets to pick number one, I believe. Yeah, yeah probably. Oh, God oh. Damn it. Oh, oh, no, it's oh, rigged. It's rigged. No. It's rigged. It's rigged. <laughs> it is definitely rigged. We'll go again. Honestly, I didn't even want this <sighs> pick to be honest. Like this act, it's actually not that good because I think we all have the same number one and the same number ten. So yeah, we we can veto them decisions as well. I think yeah. we've got to say that. Yeah, mm. so we all get one veto. I, I don't, I'm not really bothered about this. So oh, I'm it's rigged. Did you not to be worst? <laughs> <laughs> what do um okay i'm just seeing what i get okay alex you for the first pick in the, the nominations ranking starting us off number 10 i think uh no matter who had this oh, pick we were all taking the same one and that is barbie you know, uh, I'll be honest, I've kind of my outlook on this film has swung a little more positively. Like, I do think it it pumped a lot of money into the theaters and really created like a cultural phenomenon for cinema. I think it's going to inspire a lot of future filmmakers. But at the same time, just when you look at the rest of these films, this is easily the weakest one of, of the group. So Barbie is going in at our number 10. Yeah, that's what I would have picked as well. I, I, I don't hate the film. I I think all, all, the, all the films are like pretty decent there's no like bad films in this like nominations list so but it's definitely the weakest and i will say like after watching all the interviews like i do think greta gerwig was passionate about this film and really like there was a lot of excitement she brought to it so i, I it's not a film like we're really trying to shit on or anything but just compared to the rest of these films i think that's the number 10 spot for us yep um and another and because oh, i've got number nine interesting Interesting. Um, if you I'll, pick I'll what I'm thinking, you're going to pick it. Someone's going to veto mm. it immediately. Mm. <laughs> so you have to give it outside of the box. I'm going I'm to play tactically, actually, because I'm going to anticipate what's going on later on. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pick a little outsider pick. I'll go zone of interest here. Vito, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm playing tactically. <laughs> Do you actually have it that low? That is technically. No, <laughs> no, but I want your Vito's gone, so. Oh, you little rat. <laughs> I know what he's doing. I already know what he's doing next, so. So who's Vito? He's, he's trying to use your is it, he's drawing out both of my What, what, what is your pick, thing. Ryan? <laughs> I'll go with the, um, the other. Uh, I mean, I think most people would put this in ninth. I'll go Maestro. You see, like mm. he, he's playing, he, he's getting both our vetoes out the way. So we <laughs> what's next. Like I knew, as soon That's as right. you get young interest, I knew what's coming next. So yeah, obviously I'm going to veto you. My shirt does not deserve to be number nine. Yes, it does. Wow. It is exactly number nine. <laughs> no, it does not. It is my number nine. It is number okay, nine. So I'm going to have to pick something that doesn't deserve to go here. 
No, you mm. pick something that does deserve to go at nine because then you've got no vetoes left. Yeah. So what's what's you, what are you uh, taking at nine? I'll have One to go option. with my number eight. I, I'll go with American Fiction. Although I'm yeah. not slandering it, like probably Alex will later on. I, I do really like this. Yay, one. which means I get good positioning. Number eight is Maestro, and Alex can't even get rid of it. Go <laughs> <laughs> fuck yourself. Um, okay, Alex, what's your number seven? Alex, you will go. What is I'm, now? I'm just thinking, what does Oscar like the most? Like, even though I have it higher, I'm like, <laughs> things in here, but now, now I'm usually going Anatomy of a Fall next. Uh, I mean, to be fair, it was only one out from where I had it, but still. Yeah, so. Uh, still an amazing film. Right, this is this is Keep not me it, trolling right? again. I, I genuinely do have Zone of Interest at number six, so I'm going to go you that. Dude. You're killing <laughs> Oh, come on, man. I'm See, not doing I it. Just the best best film. I knew me and Best film out of these ten. Six, I knew that we'd ask for the same one too. I just didn't know the, the where you Wait, what place is this? Is this five? This is six. No, six. Oh, six. Okay, so. Um, no, this is. No, because I took eight. Then Alex took seven. You took six. So I'm five. Yeah, okay. I thought you meant which number was one of interest. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. yeah, 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 but we're on to five. All right, um, five. Then I'm taking poor things. Hmm. I did not expect you to put it that low. Top four are just top, top four is my uh, like for the four of the fo top five of the last year. So, um, I, I didn't think you were that big on Pillars of Flower Moon. I thought for sure that's what was coming here. No, oh, yeah. did you forget that? Oh. Oh, you can't go back now. Can't go back. <laughs> I completely skipped over that. I just looked at what was in my five spot. I'm deciding between two that are very close. It's a strong five. I'm happy with any order from going at this point. Oh my god! I'll, I'll go I can't the... believe I just did that. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go the holdovers. <laughs> That's yeah, fair. If... Oh, I so can't believe I just done that. Um, so is this number three? Um, number three? Yeah, number three. Hmm. The fact that Zone of Interest is off the board here is crazy. I know, it's criminal. <laughs> that is criminal. It was a ta tactical mastermind. For Anyone me. want to be our new co-host? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> drop your, drop your hand in the comments for holding it. auditions. It is the best film of life. I like Zone of Interest. If you get another co-host, they probably hate Zone of Interest. So You're probably on. right. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I just know what Ryan's done. No. I'm, just... I'm going to go past lives. It's my number four. So yeah, I that's... think it deserves to be in the top three. All right, Oscar. Pick our number one. I know what you're taking. But Ryan still has a veto. Oh no, but he thinks okay. You he's better not, not use it. He's not going to do it because okay. So number two, Depends. Killers of Flower Moon. Yeah, Oppenheimer's hmm. one. <laughs> do I veto that? Don't you dare! <laughs> no, nah, he's not. No, no, because no, I know Oppenheimer is number gonna... one, so he's not going to. It is, yeah. I mean, we knew Oppenheimer was going to land at one. I can't believe I just. Oh my god! Man. I thought for but sure our one was going to be so adventurous in Oppenheimer. I didn't realize Ryan had it that low. That's crazy. <laughs> it's a All strong right. top five. I don't know if I, I'm very proud of this collaborative ranking, but we have Ryan. Do you want to read it off? I actually wasn't keeping right. Like, I didn't write it down. Yeah, so it's number one, we have Zone of Interest. Number two, Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, no, we don't. Number three, Past Lives. Yeah, I wish we'd Zone of Interest number, number one. What'd you say? You said, you, the, you said Zone of Interest for one. Did I actually? Oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Open Hammer number one. Dude, he's strong, one. Huh? Sort of he knows what he's doing. <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. All right, let's just start from the top again. <laughs> no, yeah, number number one, we have Oppenheimer, of course, the best film from last year. Number That's two, true. also the, the second best film from last year um, on my list, Killers of the Flower Moon. Not upset, um, number three, right? we have. Yep. Um, number three, we have Past Lives. Very solid position for that. Um, number four, we have holdovers. Number five, we have poor things. Number six, the zone of interest. Seven, anatomy of a fall. Number eight, 
America or Maestro, was it? Yeah. Uh, eight was Maestro, I believe. Yeah, and then nine we have yes, it was. and then ten we have Barbie. I'm happy with that ranking. I'm not happy with that ranking. <laughs> Criminal. Yeah, Kills of Flamin is not even a top fifteen. Kills of Flamin is not even a top fifteen film of last year, and that oh, best so film of last year is in sick. <laughs> Dude, they, they, you cannot be mad about Killers of the Flower Moon. You had a chance to take it lower. He would have vetoed it for sure. There's, he would, that was your Ryan would have vetoed it. Would you have vetoed that? I, I would have, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is my number two. But you still fumbled it. <laughs> All right. So now time to talk about the number seven on our collaborative rankings. And you can, if you stay to the end of the episode, you can find out what our personal rankings are. We'll give them to you at the end, but, or if you really don't care about these three films, you can just click the time, stay up in the description, skip ahead. But we're going to, we're going to give you them at the end of the episode. But right now we're going to get into three films, which we have not covered yet this year. So to start us off, we are going to go with anatomy of a fall. Oscar, why don't you start us off here? Because as we know, this is not a film that I have tons of passion for the same way the two of you do. So, Oscar, why don't you start us off with this one? Yes, gladly. So we don't have to start with some horrible, horrible takes about this not being very good, even though it's one of the best um, films from last year and arguably some of the greatest acting of last year just from across the board. Every single performance in this film is just insane. The dog is incredible. Sandra Hill has had one of the best years for any single act actor in general, not just actor or actress in a while through this and zone of interest. She puts in an absolutely amazing performance and it's so captivating. Even the lawyer that I've seen way too many thirst trap edits over on TikTok, all amazing performances. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just absolutely love this film. And I know um, Alex hates a uh, kind of courtroom drama, film, but I think this is a lot more yes, than I that. <laughs> um, I is it, it it I hope it wins screenplay because I just don't think it's going to win anything else. Unfortunately, um, I don't know what France were doing. I haven't seen taste uh, taste of things yet, so I can't comment. But um, it's an interesting decision not to put this down for international feature because I just find it so captivating, so enthralling. Some of the one of the best dialogue driven films of last year the mystery was absolutely fantastic it kept me on, on, my, on the edge of my seats um it's two and a half hours and i highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't watched it so far because um it's so worth it um i know people are a bit annoyed about the ending because uh, a lot of people like a bit of closure i'm not that kind of person so i i loved how kind of ambiguous the ending was um and i think that really plays into its strengths honestly and i think justin trier has got such a fantastic kind of future because this is such a standout film of last year in every single aspect writing directing and acting yeah i cannot believe that france didn't pick this i have heard the taste of things is very good so it could possibly be, possibly be as good as this and it's a very strong international year so might even still not have won best international picture because there are so many great nominees this year but yeah i i, I love a good courtroom drama of course the name's kind of taken off um anatomy of a murder which is one of my favorite courtroom dramas from the 50s were a great James Stewart performance in that and this definitely has some great performances like like you were saying Sandra Hill is amazing there's a one of the best kid performances of the decade possibly he's amazing especially in the final third of this movie um I've seen an audition from him um when they're just testing him out and it's insane acting um a, a dog that does insane things you've, you've you've never seen on screen uh, a dog acting like this I, I i still don't know how they've done the stuff with this dog yeah but it, it's a good mystery um always it's a bit a bit different from um the normal courtroom dramas because you're usually kind of showing two different sides whereas i feel like this one doesn't give you a whole lot side of the like going against her i feel like there's a lot of just stuff that makes you kind of lean towards thinking that she hasn't done anything um and it, it's definitely a, an ending that leaves you on a kind of a note where you don't really know the conclusion and it leaves a lot to think about so yeah it's an interesting ending for a courtroom drama um not a lot of stuff like preparing her for the court there's a more a lot more scenes inside the courtroom drama which i kind of get where alex is coming from probably because i know he doesn't usually like these genre films and there's not a whole lot of emphasis on like 
cinematography um because you're all, it's, it's mainly just in two rooms um but i think this is a really strong screenplay it's one of the best of the year i think it would be a deserving winner also a couple of acting nominations that would be deserving for a winner uh, i don't know if, if they are gonna but yeah this this is my top 15 of the year it's it's not my favorite international uh, movie of the year like i said because it's a strong year but it, it's definitely up there i really enjoyed this we we seen it at a, a mystery screening so we didn't actually know what we were going to see when we went to see it mm. um a few people a few people walked out so it's it's not for everybody um it's quite a slow burn at times it's a long film at two and a half for a courtroom drama but i think it's really worth it it's it's one of the best of the year in my opinion alex just hates dialogue <laughs> but I do give credit where it's due. I, I've rated, you know, like Trial of Chicago 7. I really I rated, I rated the courtroom drama. I think Witness for the Prosecution is, you know, one of the best films of the golden age of Hollywood. Like, I think that, that might be the best courtroom drama. Yeah. So, like, I have like 12 Angry Men, of course. Like, 12 course, Angry I, Men. Yeah. Like, I give credit where it's due. Like, I, there, there's ones like, if, and this one, like Ryan said, like, I do think the wrong time is steep to keep someone like me interested with this. So, Right off the bat, I think Oscar already said it. Like, I hate courtroom drama. It's my least favorite genre of film. And I'm just kind of like, like, it really has to take a lot to kind of win me over with, with these kind of films. So I'm definitely not, you know, the person you really want to hear speak on a film like this because it's just, um, I'd rather talk about the films that I love and have an appreciation for rather than take a more critical approach. But yeah, I mean, just a couple thoughts. I mean, I, first off, I do think The Taste of Things was the better film. Like, I think they made the right choice nominating that. But that's not the reason they nominated it. They didn't nominate Taste of Things because they think it's the better film. It was a strategy to get two French films recognition in the Oscars. The, Italy tried this with La Dolce Vita in 1960, where they were very confident that Anatomy of a Fall would get a Best Picture nomination. And because they were very confident in that, they're like, well, then we'll have taste of things be our international selection so that that can get recognized there because that's not going to get a best picture nomination. And that way they get two French films in there. So I think it was, it was more strategic than them actually picking taste of things over mm -hmm. uh, anatomy of a fall. And I, I, I guess I'll, it nearly worked to be fair, but not picking the Pam the or winner for your, for your, for your nomination is still insane though. Mm. Yeah. It, 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 like I said, it's, it's more of a strategy than, than what they actually, I think believe in. Yeah. But, I mean, listen, there are some things that, like, I do like about this film. Like, I gave it two watches. I, I like, gave it a second chance and all. And it does have some, like, the performances are great. Sandra Holler looks like she's ready to burst into tears at any moment, but doesn't. And, you know, like, really does make you feel, like, sorry for her to a degree. Even though it, at the end it flips that and you really, at least like, I think she killed him. But that's just my interpretation. I think the child actor is great. They kind of always have him dressed in like this bold red wardrobe to like signify his like importance in the film and, and this and just the pressure. Like a kid in a, with a role this size, a, a young actor is going to feel a lot of pressure. And I think it's fitting because the character, this character, is someone who's under a lot of pressure. And I think you know the kid is really torn between the parents of like he doesn't want to see his mother go to jail, but he also wants like you know justice for his father if that's the case and like. The same way some kids kind of get torn between their parents with divorce, I think the kid does a really good job captivating, like, or capturing, I mean, the, uh, like, the, the conf inner conflict about, you know, which parent to side with when the parents clearly have their own issues between each other. And, uh, you know, he gave a phenomenal performance, really does carry the film. I think there were things like, and I think this is intentional with the, the two lawyers, where I think Sandra Holler's lawyer is very, like, dull and boring. But I think that's kind of intentional because the prosecutor is like very he's like very captivating when he speaks and very like more aggressive, more like kind of confident in the, his line delivery. And he also wears like this bolder red. So I think the way they contrast the two lawyers works very well. Like I think the Sandra Holler's lawyer was supposed to be a little more boring and not as convincing. I, at least it's just I think the direction that Justine Trier chose. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, like I did find the film kind of tough to follow. Like I was both watches. I was pretty bored and like kind of waiting for it to end. I definitely asked some interesting questions. Like there's interesting things to t think about and take away. I like the, the ambiguity to it and how, you know, there's so much uncertainty around everything, even though we live in a world with so much access to video and audio evidence, there's still so much uncertainty around everything. And it's like, how do you really make a decision with something with a court case 
in not just this one, but many court cases when there's so much uncertainty surrounding things. So it definitely does have interesting things to say. It's just not a film that really left me with, you know, much inspiration or something I'm dying to watch again. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, at the end of the day, it's not a bad film. It's just not, I, I'm not really this film's audience at the end of the day. But Oscar, do you have anything else to add about the film? Um, I think even though it's quite a dialogue driven film, I think it has some of the most like underrated cinematography of the year. I think it's shot fantastically. Like you say, kind of the way it uses colors, like the outfit specifically, I think is really, really nice and kind of how scenic it is. And I like how like the location of everything is really isolated. Um, and yeah, it, it is really, really intense, uh, and how grounded it is. Um, but just the acting kind of overall, you just feel everything from the emotions and the actors and what's going on. And I think that's just what kind of immersed me so much. And even though it's only a court drama, um, it, it was just such a nice surprise of a film, even though I kind of was anticipating it. Cause obviously at one palm door, um, at Cannes, but yeah, um, this is come for me in my top 10 of last year, and I do want to rewatch it, um, but I just haven't had the chance to get around to yet. But yeah, Ryan, have you got any additional thoughts? Mm. Yeah, I do think the, like, the courtroom scenes are proud of everything, um, especially with that lawyer, because you just, you're made to really hate him. Um, and I know like, people are really annoyed to it, almost, uh, they were almost annoyed at the actor with how annoying this character was. Um, and yeah, there's got those great scenes where like the, the son comes in and like, has to kind of recite what happened, some great scenes like that. And then when they're listening to the the like tape of them talking and it cuts between like going into the past and like I, I was actually seeing the, the argument, I think those scenes are great. But yeah, um, yeah, I don't think it was an, a well shot film, but definitely a screenplay heavy perform and performance heavy film. Um, but yeah, but I, I do love them. I, I love a, a good courtroom drama. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I did like the the ending. I thought the ending did leave you with some things to think about. Like, I think that, like I said, I think that she killed him. And I think that the kid, when she's found innocent, he smiles, but there's so many, like, mixed emotions on his face. Like, his face is constantly moving. So I think there's there's not, like, an excitement. And I do think the dog may be – like, the dog, clearly, there's, there's metaphors there that I, I'm not sure I picked up on. Because I think the dog's the only one who actually knows the truth of what happened. But I think the kid – does have some doubts and like at the end when she gets home like there's very there's not like this happiness there is kind of like a, a, a unspoken thing between them where i think she knows that he lied to, to get her out of it and i think uh you know there's also like the lawyer i think seemed very curious as to whether whether or not she did it but i mean some of the conflicts are, are definitely interesting like i like how it, it touches on the unreliability of dialogue. I think in a lot of films and just in life in general, people take dialogue and what people say is if like, that's the hundred percent, the truth. A lot of the time where the truth is like people lie, people exaggerate, like the recording of them, like obviously looks really bad when you like listen to it, but like you could probably frame almost any couple like that. Like couples argue that there's resentment. Like they, they say things they don't mean. And like, there is like this passive aggressiveness between them, especially with like the, the cheating that went on in the past and all of that, where like it kind of just has been building beneath the surface. So th like I said, there's just a lot of uncertainty and uh, yeah, definitely there, there is some, some interesting ideas and like questions that the film does raise, which are why I don't think it's a bad film, even though I do think it's, I, I was pretty bored by it to be honest. Cause I, I, even though it does make me think like, I just don't feel anything when I watch this film, like it's not a film that I left with any, Real, it's, it wasn't an emotional experience at all. Like it definitely like raised some questions, but overall, just not the most emotional experience. But that's my take. At the end of the day, I always would rather you know people listen to the ones who appreciate it because I'd rather people appreciate. I, like I want to go into every film loving it. Like so, I don't want anyone to go into this film. I mean, if you probably shouldn't be listening because we've been spoiling, but. Uh, yeah, I don't want people to go into films, you know, wanting to dislike the film. I think you should listen to the people. Try try and find a way to enjoy them all. It's just not really a film for me at the end of the day. But, Oscar, do you have anything to add? No, just that you're wrong. <laughs> I am 100% right. Horror drama is the worst genre of film for a reason. No. Oh, that's an awful take. But I guess, There's I guess, no bad I genre of film. Like there is no bad genre of film. There is, and it's courtroom drums. Black and white composer biopics. 
a great most over musical biopics okay musical <laughs> musical biopics are just pretty average to be fair i love musical biopics because at least you get to listen to good music if the movie sucks so i think that's a win <laughs> <laughs> no but a bang average film especially a musical biopic because of how consistently bang average they are it's like they're boring. I'd rather have a really, really bad film than a bang average film. No, that's my point is that they're never like that boring because at least you get to listen to good music, even if the movie sucks. <laughs> is there really that much good music in my show, though? No. Yeah, so, so that does raise like one of my bigger criticisms, which we'll get into. But let's get into by far the most overhated film of the year. And I absolutely <laughs> hate where the narrative is going. I think someone is running a Harvey Wine style smear campaign on this film. I think mm. someone is targeting this film and running a smear campaign of the called Oscar bait because this there is so much passion in this project. Listen, I get that this is not a film for everyone. Like Bradley Cooper is not trying to entertain here. He's trying to express things. And it's it's not a film that is, is going to be for everyone. It's definitely more of like an expressionist film and trying to explore certain ideas about these characters. But at the end of the day, like, there is so much passion in what he brings to this project. Like, he is detailed in his direction. He, like, literally put his heart and soul into the performance. Carrie Mulligan gives the best vocal performance of the year. Like, different actors are good at different things. It's like, it's it's there's there's so many different skill sets to acting. And we're, if we're talking just vocal acting, I think Carrie Mulligan gives the best vocal performance of the year. And... Yeah, I think like there's so much passion behind this project. To, to write it off as Oscar bait, I think is uh, just uh, very wrong, and just I, I don't like that. That's kind of where the narrative is gone. The fact that people are saying Bradley Cooper tried too hard is just makes zero sense. Like, <laughs> you should be trying as hard as you possibly can to make the best movie. And if you're saying, "Oh, he tried too hard to win an Oscar," well, if you're trying to win an Oscar, it means you're trying to make the best movie. So it's like. Now, in terms of the Oscar bait thing, like, is there Oscar bait qualities? Yes. Like, it's a film about, it's a film about marriage, which they like. It's a music biopic, which they like. However, like, American and fiction holdovers have plenty of Oscar bait qualities to them as well. And no one seems to be talking about them, even though I think that this is less Oscar bait than them. But at the end of the day, I really don't think any of these are Oscar bait. I think they're just happen to have some qualities that the Oscars traditionally, it is, it, it it tends to award but like so my biggest criticism off the rip about this film is that i like this was my number four most anticipated film on the year and in many other years would probably be like one or two like i'm i love films about music i love music heavy films and for a film about a composer the film is pretty quiet and that that's my biggest criticism is that there is a lot of times because i just feel like if it's a, a composer I would think thinks in a state of constant music. So you, I would just think there's constantly music going through his head through all the moments of his life. Like for me, like if you were to make a biopic about me, like my brain is constantly working in the state of like thinking in terms of film. So it's like, I just would think a composer would be someone who thinks in, in terms of music at all times. So I wish that it wasn't quite as quiet. And I think a lot of biopics do this thing where you have someone who accomplished all this stuff and then it's like, let's make a movie about the marriage behind the legend. And it's like, that is not the most interesting part of this character's life. Like it's like, I think mean, stories about relationships are much more interesting if it's regular everyday people where people who have all these great accomplishments, I think their relationships often take kind of a back seat. And listen, I'm a 26 year old guy with like no desire to get married. Like this, I am not the audience who cares about, movies about marriage like there is no one less interested in this subject matter than me however i do think that this it's when i go into a movie i don't just judge by the story like i don't just look at the subject matter and say is this something i'm interested in or not i judge the storytelling and i think bradley cooper is a really great storyteller and i think he does a great job telling this story and what he does that i don't see from the other two films we're talking about today is stylistic evolution where the style and way you experience his film really evolves with you know the youthful black and white like the more beautiful images even though some people don't like black and white like those are definitely the beautiful images of the film with like that freely moving camera and kind of this over-the-top directing and then it really matures as the film moves on and evolves into a much more grounded approach to it and i just love the way that he kind of evolves the style of the film with this character and how a lot of biopics will cover a lot of ages, but nothing in the film really changes where 
I think the way the, the whole direction of the film changes with the different ages. And I really like how he took that approach to evolving the style and the way we experience the film, which is why I have this film a lot higher than most people and think it's become the most overhated film of the year. But Brian, I'll pass it off to you because I know the two of you don't share my appreciation for this, this film. Yeah, it's not like my favorite of the year. I, I definitely enjoyed it at the time. Um, like you're saying, like how it like stylistically changes for it. I actually much preferred the black and white like first half of the film. It was when it went to the like, color and changed that I started to get a bit bored with the story. So I it, it, nothing against like black and white or something. I genuinely enjoyed like the first half. I was thinking like this really isn't as bad as everybody's saying. I don't get where all the hate is coming from. Um, but it's just that second half was pretty boring um I, I don't really remember much of what happened at this point because it's been a while since i watched it um but yeah i i, I think there's some storylines with the marriage like we're saying i like there's subplots of him cheating on her and stuff that i just don't think it explores very well um and like i, I definitely would have preferred the music um i do love there's like there's some great shots in this like you were saying like the the when he wakes up at the start and there's the long take and it flies out into the, the theater i think that is a great shot um and then there's the one when he's composing and there's a big shadow against the um uh, against the wall i that that shot stuck in my mind so yeah there was some great cinematography in the black and white um half the film and then it just kind of got more like a, a genetic biopic i think in the second half at least for me i just didn't enjoy it much um and there was i I did enjoy the performances. I definitely do not see the hate that Brad Cooper has been getting for this. I I think I always think it's ridiculous. I the people the fact that people are still mocking him whenever someone wins an award at this point, even though it's been known for a good couple of months now that he's not going to win the Oscar and they're still kind of mocking him that he's not going to win it is a bit ridiculous. Uh, I, I definitely think there's a lot of passion behind this. Like th this is not just a film that he just randomly decided to direct. It was. The start was Scorsese and then went to Spielberg and then um, Spielberg gave it to him because he saw how great a star is born um, was. So yeah, he's, he's got a history in kind of more musical films, at least from his, his director debut. I think this was definitely a good a good way for him to go down. And he's definitely got some passion into it. Like he, he really did have a passion for Leonard Bernstein. Uh, he did really care about his story and like um, his career. So it's, it's definitely not just him going for an Oscar. Although, of course, he definitely wanted one. And I think he, he's maybe a bit, he's kind of passed him. I think he definitely deserves like an Oscar at this point. He's been, he'd missed out on a, couple, on a few, a couple of times at this point. Um, and I think he definitely will get one in the future. But uh, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, I'm kind of glad this isn't going to win anything because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it winning personally. But it, it, it's not as bad as people are saying. I think it's a, it's a very solid film. Yeah, I, I agree. I think like the narrative and talks around everything is, has gone way out of control, honestly. Um, there's been so many more oscar baby films over the years than this, and I don't think this is even that bad. Like, I, I didn't even love the film. I, I think it's perfectly solid, perfectly fun film. Um, Bradley Cooper's talent as a director is absolutely there. I think his composition is top-notch, and I think... His use of color is fantastic like you said right and i thought I, I for the first half in the black and white section i was thinking this is not as bad as people saying this i really liked the first half a lot but after that the script just falls apart for me and it, it just becomes pretty lifeless and it, it kind of loses a lot of focus and bits are just touched on and left and kind of half baked in the second half of the film which just just it just crumbled unfortunately um Carrie Mulligan obviously absolutely steals the show. Easy, the best performance in that film. She is such an incredible actress. She just commands every single scene. I still thought Cooper was fantastic, but just not as not as good as Carrie Mulligan was. Um, I also think it, the second act drags on for quite a bit longer than it needs to, honestly. Um, the ending I did like the last shot specifically. Um, I thought works really, really well. And that uh, that church scene where he conducts is is definitely as good as people were kind of hyping it up as this, being something. This may be a whole take. I did not like the church scene. I felt it was I thought it was probably over the top. I, and not in the way that I I'm saying it. he's trying too hard. I just didn't 
it just doesn't like he was sweating like very sweating like <laughs> yeah you have to be going that hard I, I don't know maybe it was realistic um yeah um there's definitely room for improvement in the script but i thought his direction in a whole was was genuinely really really strong i'm excited to see what he does next um because i absolutely love the star is born i think that's definitely the much better film for me i i still listen to the soundtrack of that film um two fantastic performances in that film and i Sadly, couldn't replicate that in this, but I, I, I am really interested to see where he goes because he's definitely a talented director and he's definitely got that passion for it. Um, just not one of my favorite films of last year. I, I have a, I gave it a uh, three star, so pretty middle of the road, but um, it had promise, just unfortunately died out. So yeah, it was one of my favorite films of the year. Like this is if we're ranking, it, it's up in this way. I won't spoil my Oscar rankings, but like it's high up in in my. In terms of films that were nominated, it's it's definitely one of my highest of the year. And listen, it's no secret that Bradley Cooper is my favorite actor. Like I, he's my favorite actor working today. I'm a huge fan of him. So is it coming with some bias? Yes, but that bias is going to get like I'm going to give the film at least two watches because I'm a fan of his. I'm not going to give it four. And this film didn't play at Regals or AMC, so I actually had to buy a ticket for all four watches. And I really do think it's that good. And, and also, in terms of people saying, like, you wanted the Oscar too much, listen, we're from Philly. We like championships. This is a sports city. We like championships. So, yeah, he wants an Oscar. Like, that. that's just – that's how we think. But I also, like – I think a lot of people are going into this film expecting Oscar bait, and I think that's kind of shaping the, the narrative for a lot of people where, like, they're going in with kind of expecting it. So they're just kind of looking for things that's like, oh, well, like, yep, that's Oscar bait. Yep, they're right about this where – I'm surprised how many just regular non-movie fans I've talked to who actually like this film. Like people who don't watch a lot of films, a, a good amount of them have actually said very positive things about this film, which has been interesting to see. And, you know, I think, I, like I said, I think he brings, this is one of the most passionate directions of all the nominees this year. And I think this film is brilliant in editing visuals and performance. I think that the problem is the audio. It's it's not always great. And I do think there, there's a couple scenes that I call, I, I have a, 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 I call it the ultra bore scene where it's, you know, just coverage like back and forth talking scenes with no sound or music at all. I call those ultra bore because they're normally it's just so standard and kind of boring. And he does do that like two or three times, but mo mostly the film uses no coverage. Like he's not playing it safe like others, and he's just really doing long takes and almost like you're in the theater. Like I'm not the biggest fan of dialogue, but when it's there. I like to see it done in long takes where it's more natural and just the one act, one actor bouncing off each other and just like literally listening to the actors and just letting it play out like real life in a real conversation. And it, he does that. Like he lets the, he lets the actors go when, when there's time to talk and there's a very musical quality and a rhythmic quality, the way the actors speak, which I, I thought was a, which I really liked about the film and made the dialogue more engaging, at least for me. And you know, him and Carrie Mulligan, of course, are two of the best performers today. And seeing them two on screen together, they do a great job. Of course, Carrie Mulligan does give the best performance of the film. Like, she, she's great in everything, and this is no different. And, yeah, in terms of Bradley Cooper's direction, like, he really commits to his images. He doesn't use the coverage, and he really uh, commits a lot to it. And I think that there's so many great moments. Like, one of them is when the whole breakup sequence in the middle of the film, I th think, is one of the film's strongest, where... He has first we see he finishes the piece and like it's this kind of long take. It goes with interior to exterior and Car Carrie Mulligan kind of like runs away and jumps into the pool where she can't hear anymore. As we hear the music, she jumps into the pool and kind of like avoids hearing it. And then when we go to the uh, the actual performance, it's this super grand big shot. And we're moving in like kind of slowly. It's like a big crane shot into the audience. And the human eye is drawn first to brightness, second to motion. And the first thing our eye is drawn to is, I think it's a light blue dress on the lower level. So we're looking there, and as we keep moving in, we start to realize, and that, that kind of is cut out of the frame, we realize that it was actually misdirecting our eye. And as we get closer, we're now drawn to the motion of just Bradley Cooper just moving his thumb slightly. And it's like, there's, it's a still a wide shot full of people, but everyone is completely still. And the way he draws your eye, just that small motion of his hand. And that's important because that hand, when he then uh, like holds hands with the the guy next to him, who's like his boyfriend or like uh, the guy he's like cheating on his wife with, 
that's like the moment where Carrie Mulligan looks and just the way he tells the story just with the hands of them from this big grand shot to a really tight and intimate shot all leading to the breakup is I think very good in going from a grand moment to a very intimate moment. And I think he does a great job with that. And then of course, after the music carries on after the performance, we see him being celebrated and we just have the two, it's like a split screen shot of this huge crowd of people on the left and Carrie Mulligan just by herself walking away on the right. And then of course she goes and gets his stuff and like puts it outside. And I got to say like the way she places like, seeing the slippers with his initials and like everything placed outside, just that shot lets us know everything without a single word of dialogue, but also like, that's a long take. It's not like they set up that shot and filmed it. Like Carrie Mulligan so quickly and smoothly places everything and all like this, it's like so nicely composed all of his stuff. It's like, she had to have had to rehearse that a bunch of times because like the pillow and slippers and everything falls into place just so perfectly. So it's little things like that that I think a lot of people don't notice, but like that's that most people would just cut in because having it land that perfectly in a long take, I'm sure was a lot more time on set. And of course, a lot of people are talking about the the long take on uh, the Thanksgiving Day Parade where it's just the two of them. They're distant in the frame. They're long shots for both of them. And just like the rhythm of the dialogue between them and the speed and the way Carrie Mulligan's like speech just wins that argument in the end and then as like after that the braid flow timing just goes by perfectly and darkens the room as there's just we hold on silence i think that was you know one that's what i'm saying when i say like this scene this film not every scene is great but this film does have some of the best scenes of the year like i think the long conducting take is incredible and like this thanksgiving scene as well like this film i think really does have some of the best scenes of the year. And he does, he makes a lot of really bold artistic choices that I don't see from uh, every single one of the nominees this year, which is why I really wish the conversation around this film was a lot different from what it is. Yeah, I do agree with the, the kind of conversation about it around the film. I think I, I, I don't really like the term Oscar bait in general because I agree. I mean, especially, especially like films like this where there is like so much passion behind it. But I think, I think people tend to just put it on the films they don't like rather than actually looking at the stuff that is Oscar about. Um, and it's easy to do with this film, like a black and white biopic. Like people generally just going to assume that it's it is Oscar about just from that alone instead of actually just, like you said, they'll be going into the film assuming that it all day is Oscar about. Um, but yeah, I did, I did, there are stuff that I really liked with the relationship, Karen Mulligan's character dying at the end, like that is a really sad like moment, um, which did save kind of like the second half of the film. The, it, it was the least surprising thing to happen because there's not a single scene in this film where they aren't smoking. So I did expect more <laughs> of them to get out of the end. Um, but yeah, it's, just like I said, the, there's just there's a lot more. It's a it's kind of first half heavy in the moments that I really enjoyed. Um, and my rating just kind of went down and down as a as the film went on, but yet yeah, I still give it a few and a half. It's a it's, it's a very solid film. Um, just not up the top of the um like my top ten twenty range of this year because it is a really strong year. But yeah, I, I don't hate that it's the fact that it's nominated. It's still a very a very good film. I think it's it's fine. I guess there's just. Not one of my favorites, but yeah, like I said, um, I hope he does something interesting next. Maybe move away from the musical biopics, even though Star is Born was absolutely fantastic, probably because that had amazing music in it. And Lady Gaga is also a great actress. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated to see what he does next. He's he's he, he'll be going places, I hope. Probably before he's probably gonna win an Oscar before Eagles next win a Super Bowl. Let's be honest. Go fuck yourself. That's not uh, anytime soon. That's not anytime soon. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> had to be said. Had to be said. It did not need to be said. It did. If Bradley Cooper was in the conversation, and you're like, I'm gonna pick. I would. I would have plenty more to say if I knew what your soccer team was, but I don't because I don't follow it. <laughs> <Yeah. that. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh god <laughs> but yeah he he does a great job and uh i think that you know he'll he'll get his oscar recognition soon along with the nice second eagle super bowl which it's only a matter of when but i don't want to think jason kelsey is retired so honestly bring up the eagles makes me want to cry because we just lost a legend but 
Yeah, I think, you know, he does a lot of the great ways he evolves his character. Uh, also, just Ryan mentioned the smoking and apparently so the real uh, Leonard Bernstein, his voice actually dropped an octave as he got older. So they had different voices that Cooper had to do and they studied with, I, I forget the guy's name, but apparently he's like the best dialect coach in, in Hollywood really was like a big part of this this process. But like I said, I think Carrie Mulligan is the best, gives the best vocal performance in anything this year. And she speaks with just such a rhythm and like a sharpness to her vocals. And it really shines in that one. It's it's a medium close up frontal. I also think the four three aspect ratio is so great for this film. And just those, the way it captures those close ups, especially in this one scene where she has just this long take monologue. It, it holds on her for the entire time. And there she just speech that she her speech is so like rapid fire and sharp and like just like cutting the kids off if they mention anything to do with with Lenny and she just doesn't want it. She doesn't want to hear it. And I think just her, uh, like I, it's just one of those things like you can't even really put into words Her performance there. She's just consumed in the role at all times. And I think very few actresses could have pulled that scene and that shot off like her with that, just going for that extended period of time consumed in the character with the way that character speaks is just another showcase of impressive acting from her. You know, some other just great direction, that Cooper brings to this film is like that opening uh, shot where the window is like dwarfing him, like it's way bigger. And then he opens it up with the light. Cause like, this is such a, a big day for him. And in the beginning, you see a lot of like theatrical surrealism where it's very like kind of theater like, but also like very surrealist at the same time as you know, he's in the prime of his career and just like kind of lost in imagination and all of that. And yeah, I think the theatrical surrealism, like all that stuff works really well, which is why, a lot of people like the first half better than the second half. I actually still really do like the second half, though. Like, I think the second half, there's still a lot of really good storytelling from Bradley Cooper. Actually, another small one is that one shot where it's, like, down the line of trees, and they're just so tightly framed in, like, a triangle of the fence. And, like, you can just see this is, like, before the breakup, and a lot of what they're talking about, it's just, like, they're just bullshitting each other. And, yeah, I think uh, – and then also, like, there's the, in the second half, the one phone call where he calls his daughter, and it's like, he's free to indulge in whatever he wants to now. Like, he doesn't, he, he once again can be totally free now that he's not married, but it's not what he wants because, you know, she meant more to him, and he kind of has to lose her to, to appreciate her. And I think the handheld phone call where, like, he's off center and close up, his head's down, is, is such a great way of using, you know, tight space and camera to reflect how he's feeling in that moment. And yeah, I think the relate, like I said, like I am not into romance movies. I'm really not into movies about marriage. Like you want to, something I can't relate to like marriage. I, I can't relate to that at all, but it's uh, yeah, I think they, they do a good job at making it effective. And it really does ask the question of like, is unfaithful love still love? Cause we know that he wasn't faithful to Carrie Mulligan, but we really feel the presence of like, we feel the difference in him when, when they break up and like her death, like you feel the impact of that after like that drive away where they kind of have all, if you notice all three of the kids are in the back seat and Cooper drives alone uh, in the front seat, because they kind of leave that, that seat in the front open for her. Like it's kind of, they preserve the empty seat for her and it kind of just like drives off with the, cause this music, ha this film has some really grand music, but when Carrie Mulligan dies, it's just like this very calm, slow piano. And I think it's just like, for, from all the grandness, I think it, in contrast, fits so perfectly to make that such a powerful moment. And yeah, I really like the way they they do her death with like the silence of it and just the breaths until the breaths go away. And then we kind of look out the window. And I just think that was very powerful. And like, at least for me, like every, all four watches of this film, like her death was very felt. Like it really was like uh it was just impactful emotionally like it's sad and you do feel the emptiness is, is the word i'm looking for like you feel that emptiness after and uh cooper executes it i think in a very poetic way and then after it's like you have the the time jump where he's almost like a zombie almost with the red light and just the look on his face as he kind of just is like indulging in whatever it is he wants to do but it's lost what kind of really grounded him and uh kind of the, the impact that carrie mulligan's character had on him uh, that he no longer has. But yeah, overall, I think, you know, Bradley Cooper, it's interesting to see how far he's come as an artist. He's someone who I've been a big fan of his whole career and I can't wait to see what he does next. I think he's, he's really 
in his second film has proven himself as a director to watch. And even if you don't like this film, there's no denying that he brings a very creative, passionate direction. So, yeah, I just love to see where he's come. I would like to see this film, you know, maybe take home an award or two. I think it's probably only really in contention for best hair and makeup, but which I think it absolutely, I do think should win. Like, I think it really knocks it out of the yeah. bargain for both of them. Yeah, makeup in the second half is so good when it ages them up, both, both him and Carrie Mulligan. I think it's amazing. Uh-huh. I think that would definitely would be my pick. 100%. And also, like, the, the hair they do. Like, the amount of different hairstyles in this film, there's a huge range to it. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I really do like this film a lot, and I'd like to see it. Uh, i like to spread some positivity about it because I know there's a lot of, wrongful negative attention towards it all right so now we'll move on to american fiction this is one that you know is is in contention for some awards mainly uh best original screenplay or best sorry best adapted screenplay and yeah so oscar why don't you start us off on american fiction what are your thoughts on this film starring jeffrey wright from first time director for jefferson yeah i really like this film it's not i i I think we're kind of lacking in satires now. So this is kind of a really nice refresher because I thought the comedy worked really well. Um, the balance of satire and family drama I thought was impressive because I think that's quite a, a difficult thing to balance in a in a film like this, um, especially when kind of the sat the satirical side is quite heavy um, and the family drama side as well. Um, the performances are absolutely fantastic. I thought Jeffrey Wright was brilliant, but Sterling K. Brown in the supporting role was absolutely amazing. Um, pe- people who haven't seen this film will probably be like, oh, why have they got nominations? People deserved it more. I- I'd say they're thoroughly deserving of these nominations. The-, the performances across the board in this film worked really, really well for me. Um, I didn't love the ending. I think that I brought it down a tiny bit for me. It just it felt a a tad abrupt um but overall um i was just surprised by how much of an uh kind of an, an emotional punch we got out of it considering um the satirical side was like i said it was quite heavy so um i i really really enjoyed my time with this film yeah i've really enjoyed this as well i think it's one of the strongest screenplays of the year it's it's really funny whilst yeah it, it perfectly i think it perfectly balances that like family side as well like you were saying hello that's mainly what I've been seeing a lot of criticisms of it. But I think it is it is really good. Like he's got his his mother that's got dementia and then his sister dies. Um I think all that is like really good. Um and definitely really emotional actually. Even though like a lot of the film has a lot of comedy, it still hits those emotional beats really well, I think. I did not think like Jeffrey Wright was capable of leading a film. Um, at least before this. I, I don't think I've ever seen him in a lead before. Um and that obviously heard a lot of great things about this. This was kind of a thing that was doing really well in awards um during award season like without even knowing anything about the film or even knowing, knowing what it was really it was a film that had a, a big a, a lot of expectations going into it um also knowing that it was going to get that best picture nominee before we even got to see it because it, it did quite well to get to the uk but yeah I, I was really happy with it i'm surprised i have not seen that many people really like this because I, I came out of this and thought it was great um i mean oscar both gave it fours um, I know I mine I'll, three and a half. Oh, I thought we'd be seeing. I thought I'd be seeing more people like up in that range, but I've been seeing a lot of two and a half, twos even. Um, which I I don't really get. I think it, it does a good job of mixing all those sides of comedy and emotion. Um, and I, I have some great performances. I think in there and Stellan K Brown. That's kind of the one that was like like in holdovers where you're watching divine joy randolph you're like picking this as worth like nomination worthy and i i didn't expect him to get one but so it was a nice surprise to get him i think and really all the family um there's a lot of um satire stuff like you were saying which is i think is blended in really well like his book that he reads i think that some of that is hilarious um uh i spe- I, I did like the end where it kind of like I'm struggling to even remember what the, the final shot of the film was, but I liked at the end where it was like it would do like fake scenarios and then go back and um, show you what actually happened. I really like that part. Um, but yeah, I think this is maybe one that is hurt by people not seeing it in the theater. I think people are just watching it because it's a best picture nominee and they'd be watching it online. And although it's not like a film that you'd need to go and see it in a theater experience, it, but I think it definitely helps that immersion into the. Like, so you'd actually care about the drama and the comedy and all that together. I think people are maybe just watching it get the nominee and then not really 
focusing too much on it and that's maybe why it's been getting lower ratings but I, I know um, Alex you don't think as highly as this so what did you think about American Fiction? Yeah so I don't uh, have as positive of an outlook on this film anymore uh, I'll start with the good so like on a first watch I like this definitely a lot more I think that you know the comedy on a first watch a lot of it landed and I think the subject matter is a lot of things that a lot of us think and like i agree with a lot of like the message of the film like i like what the film has to say and i like that there's a film that's you know talking about a lot of what the film has to say i just don't love the execution of it and i think the the way it's it's kind of i feel like the subject matter for a lot of people is making it uh, kind of for, if be forgiven of its credit of its flaws where just because it's talking about a lot of things that people think we should be talking about which i do think we should i think that we're overlooking the fact that the direction is like ultra minimalist. It's, uh, it's, I don't know. It just feels kind of like a, a standard TV movie direction to me. Like there's, this just doesn't feel quite like an Oscar quality movie to me. Like there's, do we really like, do I like some things in the script? Yes. But like, are we really picking this over perfect days and like, EO Capitano? Yeah, that's fair. Like, there's, T- there's TV a- movie is about maybe about far, but I, I yeah, don't know I think that's, this, so. yeah. I really don't because like what is there that cinematically that really elevates this film? Like it doesn't really use any of the story, the storytelling tools or techniques of cinema. Like it's entirely told for the dialogue, which is that's pretty much a TV, the TV standard type of way of making, making films or TV or media. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of focus on the positives to start because there are things I like about this film. And like on the first watch, I really did like it a lot. I had a feeling it wouldn't be as rewatchable and I don't think it has a lot of rewatch value necessarily. If there's not a lot, you're really going to pick up on, on a second watch and compared to a first watch where, uh, you know, I think it, it's the comedy is freshest on the first watch and that's when it's at its best. So I the start, I love the conversation at, towards the end about Jeff with Jeffrey Wright and the other author where uh, I think her name was Centauri, the character. And I think I love that conversation where she's like, well, I think your problem is with, you know, the white people who feel like these are the only stories that can be told rather than her herself. And like, you know, the best I can relate to that is being Italian American, where there's always this push into like the mob genre and kind of in, you know, my culture, everyone, like there's a push from Hollywood to only really tell Italian stories that are in the mob world. And I'm someone who's written films that are in that world, but I always kind of felt that it's the problem of the people who think that that's the only type of Italian story or who only want to make or watch those that are the problem. It's not Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola's fault. So I've always kind of taken her, her, her side on that one. So I really like that conversation a lot. I thought that was one of the, the highlights of the film. And overall, I like a lot of the satire. Like I think the satire scenes are where the film is at its best. And I think there's a lot of like funny moments there. I think, you know, for me, the, the stuff I didn't love was like Ryan said, it's, it's the family. I know it, it seems to have been more effective for you, but I feel like that's where the film kind of starts falling flat for me. And it feels a little generic and a lot of forced exposition dumps. But I do think the satire works well. I think the satire, they, they did a very good job with like the opening of the film, I think is, is great. It sets the tone and the conflicts right away. And it's hilarious, like, when she storms out crying and he's like, I got over it. So I think that that was, like, that was a pretty entertaining scene. And, like, for, like honestly, all this stuff with the book, I think, is good comedy. Like, when he's like, I want to name it Fuck. And then on the other end, they're like, we love it. <laughs> like, that, that whole phone call was great. I think a lot of the stuff with the, uh, the the judging panel, like like I said, like, most of the stuff that involves the book and the satire I think works really well. Most of my criticisms come when it gets into like the family stuff, but yeah, overall, I mean, there is good things here. Just like I said, like it's, it is, does the comedy land? Yes. But like, it's kind of like your standard filmmaking in terms of a comedy movie, which is why I'm like, is this really, is this really an Oscar quality movie when you compare it to things like perfect days and monster? So that's just, that's just me. Satire is just, maybe it's, I, I quite like them keeping them a bit kind of rare and just have them every now and again rather than a lot because I feel they like they could get a lot uh quite a bit tiring for some people but I, I really enjoy them every now and again because there's always something in kind of 
society and things like that that like is really important it's nice to kind of get a comedic aspect out of that like taking the mick out of it um and i think this works really well considering the subject matter is important um and i i know it's i don't think it's going to pick up any awards um but in uh, any other year but i think it's ridiculously stacked this year it, it could have easily done that um I can definitely see myself re-watching this though because I think the comedic aspects are, are brilliant. The, the whole stuff about the fake, uh, the film that he uh, was going to um, write was uh, <laughs> the name, I forgot the name <laughs> of the film that he was going to um, direct. That was, that was crazy, but I just, yeah, just I think that the chemistry they play off really well and even with the kind of other like very minimal side characters, um, the ones that we see over the phone, I think those scenes were, were really, really done well. I know Alex said, obviously, it's not a very cinematic film. And it's not massively director strong. It's much more of a screenplay heavy film. But I, um, I don't mind that. I, I, I'm I, someone who, who likes dialogue and I'm not necessarily all about the image. But uh, this definitely supported that because the dialogue was absolutely fantastic. And like I said, in any of the year, maybe this would have picked up best original screenplay, but um, I'll be surprised if it does. But uh, yeah, we'll see on Sunday night. Yeah, I don't disagree with really anything you've said, Alex. I do agree that it's just kind of standard direction. But yeah, I, I do really like the screenplay. Um, I, I I just remembered like those scenes where he's pretending to be someone that just got out of jail. I really like those. I think they were really good um, like comedy moments. Um, I just remember oh, the, the end. I, did you not like the end where it was like um, he sees them filming 12 Years a Slave like as they're driving away? I actually did like the end. I thought the end is like, oh. yeah, I think I, it was the greatest ending ever. Like, I, I, so I could get where Oscar's coming from. Like, I, it wasn't like it blew me away, but I thought it was good. I was kind of like, yeah, like I like the unspoken thing between him and the one actor. So yeah, I, I, the ending worked mm. for me. I just what was there was good. I just thought the 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 family side of things kind of just ended uh, too abruptly, honestly. But um, what was I feel like what we got out the emotional payoff before that works well. It's just yeah, just some of the side of the things just felt like they were a bit cut off, honestly. Real quick, just about the the end. I think I think even like worse than the family. I really didn't like the relationship part. Like I thought that felt ultra forced and like the thing of like. I feel like a lot of movies feel like they have to have a love narrative and this definitely kind of bought into that. And I really didn't think it, it fit well into it, but at the end, he's like, yeah, she won't return my calls. And I'm like, you got into an argument over a book. Like, mm. She's really not returning your calls because you got into an argument over a book. That seems a little extreme, but he was a big deck in it though. He was, but like it's, it's one argument. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I don't know. I can agree that it, I don't know if it's the most rewatchable film, to be honest. It, it could possibly go down if I rewatched it. But I did really enjoy like the theater experience of it, so I don't want to move it down without like a rewatch. Um, but I don't know when that will happen. But yeah, I don't hate that it was it was nominated. It wouldn't be in my ten. There's definitely better films this year, but uh, especially because the the performance and the screenplay, I, I I respect that it was it was in the top ten. Yeah, now on to, you know, some of the things that uh, I don't love as much. I mean, the first is kind of, like I said, I think it's a lot of tell on show. I don't think it, I think it really does uh, kind of rely. Hey, listen, is it screenplay heavy? Yes. The thing is that while I think the screenplay explores interesting things, I don't think it's the best screenplay as well, because I do think there's a lot of kind of forced exposition dumps. And I think a lot of the, the formulas are very clear. Like this, as soon as him and his sister have like they talk about things they hadn't talked about she just dies right there and it's like i don't know some of those some of the screenwriting choices don't don't work for me as well even though i actually think the dialogue is good like I, a lot a lot not all but a lot of the dialogue i think is is pretty good like there are good lines in the film for sure like there's definitely some interesting quotes that uh that have interesting things like to to make you think about like yeah and i think uh you know, I, I do think it's a little in terms of rewatchability, like I said, like surface level. Like, I don't think there's really a lot to be explored on a rewatch as much. You know, I gave it two watches both in theaters. And I, I got to say also, like, this is the, the thing that I think is a little interesting to me about it is that both times I went to the theater, the entire theater, everyone in there, it looked like rich white people who work in academia. Like, I, I do kind of, to a degree, feel like the film is 
becoming what it's criticizing, maybe not intentionally, but just the way the reception's been. Like, I it says, like, oh, they just want something to, like, stay relevant at cocktail parties. And I feel like the only people who are seeing this film are, like, rich people who want to talk about it at cocktail parties. Yeah, it does feel like that, but especially because it was a lot of praise from, like, critics and just the Academy in general, just before people even really seen it. So it does mean that, yeah, like... Yeah, it's kind of what I mean. It's like, I feel like it's getting all this praise from like critics and like people in like the, the more elite circles, but it's like, we all follow a lot of people on Letterboxd. Like, does anyone really have this above a four? I think like everyone really, for the most part, has it in the three and a half, four star range. And it's really like the people who the movie's criticizing, a lot of which I think are trying to prove that the movie's not them, even though like they're like the main people the film's criticizing, are a lot of people who are being the ones to praise this film the most where I think most general people are like, yeah, it's like, it's a solid, good movie, like it's a solid three and a half, four star movie. It's an entertaining watch. It's, you know, it makes you think it, it, it got a couple laughs, but I think the people are like, this is the movie of the year. It's like a lot of the people who the film is criticizing. So I don't know. I just find it interesting because I think that I like a lot of its criticism and I think it's interesting how to a degree, I think it's kind of backfired and, become like a movie that where the most of the audience is like white elites so i don't know i just think that's it's kind of interesting seeing the response to it but yeah at the end of the day like this isn't a bad film like i've definitely given some criticisms to it just now but like it's not a bad film like i'm glad that it was made i'm glad that it exists it's just not a, a, a top 10 film of the year in my opinion yeah i agree kind of sits around 30 of the year for me but um was a pretty pretty stacked top ten and um I'm is to be fair, the nominees for me are much better than twenty twenty two because in twenty twenty two none of my top four got anything at the Oscars. So um I'm happy about that. But my like four of my top five got best picture nominations this year, so I'll take it. Yeah, it was maybe a bit stronger overall. There was a yeah, I mean the, the, the from both years Oscars. there was movies that I didn't there was movies I didn't love from both years. Yeah, yeah, definitely from really 2022. Yeah, I think this year only two movies in my top 10 were nominated, but I think that the nominees I'm a lot Damn. happier with this year than the, the ones of last year for sure. Like last year, yeah, there my... was like great, great films that didn't get nominated last year. Oh my goodness. My top four last year, Decision to Leave, Nope, After Some Babylon, all got absolutely nothing at the Oscars. And the Batman. And the Batman as well. I mean, someone like Avatar yeah. and the Way of Water getting nominated. Criminal. Criminal. Yeah, way, and yeah. it didn't win. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's also not forget, though, that that the uh, the Best Picture Award is a producer's award. Like, that's not... That is award. true. That's not the, the art, the award, like, really for the artist. It's the more of the money people award. So, like, when you see mm-hmm. Avatar and Barbie, like you kind of have to at least understand why it's in there because that that's a producer's award. And I I still don't know exactly what the in and out is of like the voting for the Oscars, but I know that there's different divisions who vote. So I don't know if it's only producers who vote best picture or how that works, but if it is only the producers voting best picture, then like it does explain a lot. I think everybody votes for best picture. Yeah. Um, Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like I said, yeah, it's 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 the producers award, and those are not the people who. Gen- I'm they're listen, they're artistic producers for sure, but there's a lot of them who are also just you know more financially minded and are not as interested in the arts. Mm. Yeah, this year is definitely a better roster in my opinion um, for best picture lineups. So they've woken up decently compared to last year because last year was horrific for snubs. Um, Let's hope the awards on Sunday don't dig them back into their own grave that they're already half in and trying to climb out of. Um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting night. So let's get into our our actual rankings of the best picture nominees. So Ryan, why don't you start us off? What's what's your rankings for for best picture this year? Okay, for best picture. Mine's was actually kind of similar to our collaborative ranking. Um, of course, number 10, I had Barbie. Definitely, I think we all have that at last place. It's nothing against the film. It's not really 
completely our thing, really. But yeah, I respect I respect Greta Gerwig, um, direction in that. It was a good, it was a solid film. Um, number nine, Maestro was talked about that. Um, I still enjoyed it. I don't hate any of the films on this list, um, but that's my number nine. Number eight, American Fiction, solid film. I think all the eight, eight going all onwards to number one. I think are all very good films. Um, close to like my top twenty range of the year. So yeah, number eight, American Fiction. Number seven, Anatomy of a Fall. We talked about that as well. Number six, Zone of Interest. You, I know you won't like that, but I, I think the top five is very, very strong. So it's it, that is that's in my top ten of the year. Um, well, the, the top six are all in my top ten. So yeah, a lot of the nominees are in my top ten of the year, like we were saying. Compared to last year, it probably was less. Um, and so number five, I have the holdovers. We've done an episode on that. Where thoughts? If you want to hear that. But I really, really enjoyed that. That'll be something that I return to every year. So it's a, a, a great nomination, I, I think. Um, number four, Past Lives. Another one of the the great, the best films of the year. Um, number three, Poor Things. I think that is also in my number or my top five of the year. Um, number two, Killers of the Flower Moon. That is my number two for the year. I really wish I had a better chance it, in general at just anything at the Oscars this year. I think only Lily Gladstone even has a chance. Um, snubbed for best or best um best screenplay, uh, adapted screenplay. Yeah, get, yeah, and saying that it didn't get a nomination. Um, that was crazy. Also, Leonardo DiCaprio, where's his nomination? Yeah, he should definitely mm. be in that. That, that actor's wasn't list. the best performance in the film, but it, it, it was it, a very it, stacked film. One of the best performances of the year, though. I think it was exactly. Mm. Yeah, and then number one. Of course, it's it's Oppenheimer. It's I think by far the best film of the year, one of the best films of the decade. I think, and this will be this will be the best picture winner, um, deservedly for Christopher Nolan. So that's my that's my number one and my 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 top ten, or my ranking of the top ten. Interesting, interesting ranking. We have a kind of similar bottom places. I've got Barbie at ten. Um, yeah, like they said, just not not our thing really i guess i thought i agree with what he's trying to say and i love greta gerwig i think lady bird and little women absolutely fantastic films i love with little women to death so i've seen that film so many times um but yeah i just felt like the message could have been done in a better way than what it was done to be honest um that's just my opinion um number nine i have maestro as well like we've just talked about it's a solid film solid solid film um then we are i have american fiction eight um like like we said it's it's pretty funny um i have that uh actually i'll go i'll go with my rating as well barbie i have a two and a half out of five my driver three out of five american fiction i have a three and a half out of five and after kind of eight i have a bit of a jump um, actually real quick why don't we also give where we have these films ranked on the year as a whole Ooh. okay 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 so I have seen a grand total of 124 films that were released from 2023. I have Barbie at 85. Um, I have Maestro at 53. And I have American Fiction at 36. So we kind of, after this, we got a bit of a jump. Um, Killers of Flower Moon. I have only seen this once. This was a London Film Festival at the UK premiere. I do need to watch it again. Um, definitely. I gave this a four. Um, it's actually gone up over time. Um, I don't think it's one of Scorsese's best, but it has some incredible performances. And overall, I did really like it. It just didn't have that usual Scorsese pull that um, his films have for me anyway. Um, again, like I said, gave this four out of five, and this sits at number 18 of the year. And after this, um, we have a massive jump because all of these next six are in my top 10 of the year. So starting with Anatomy of a Fall, like I've said, a fantastic film that Alex is completely wrong about. Um, I gave this a four and a half out of five initially, and it still stayed that same spot. This is my number nine of the year and number six of my best picture rankings. Then I have Poor Things, which I gave initially at london film festival of five on rewatch i lowered it to a 4.5 i think that has a couple pacing issues but we've spoken about this in one of our episodes fantastic film incredible cinematography and some of the best performances all around of the year and one of the, my favorite ensembles as well and your just continues to impress me with every film he does 
in at number four in my best picture rankings i have past lives it's uh where can you go wrong with this film um some of the one of the best shot films of the year visual storytelling on point the script is fantastic and so are the performances it's such a sad film and it probably has the most underrated score of the uh year as well i gave this a four and a half out of five and this sits at number five of the year for me then in uh third spot i in my best picture rankings i have the holdovers we also did another episode on this um like a lot of these all the performances across the board absolutely incredible dominic sessa is a hell of a debut performance um it's just I, I just love this kind of even though they're not father and son dynamic i love those kind of dynamics that it gives off and i feel like i've said this boy it's a bit lacking in hollywood so i this film just so many emotions and i think it pays off so so well um so yeah like i said gave this four and a half out of five this sits at number four of the year for me and now getting into one and two of my best picture rankings and both of these here one and at uh one and two of the year so in second spot in best picture ranking i have oppenheimer a film that i've seen six times now five times in cinema um twice in imax three times in imax sorry not twice um it's an unbelievable achievement of a film and more one that will only that will only just age perfectly with time it's by far nolan's best film it's his best written film it's his best directed film i think it's his best film visually um it's just absurd kind of the level that he's working at now um and i think he's taken such a leap in his career in 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 his past couple projects compared to what he was doing because i don't i'm not a a massive fan of nolan like pre tenet or dunkirk i think he's a good director but i think he's come on a lot since then and his writing has improved massively um which is his big which was his biggest weakness before and this is just um by far like i said his best written film and i think it's such a spectacle and one that I will kindly rewatch any day of the week. Um, but at number one, actually, sorry, Oppenheimer, I have a five out of five, but at number one of my best picture rankings and number one, my favorite film of 2023, by a decent way is The Zone of Interest, a film that I saw initially at London Film Festival um, at the UK premiere, absolutely blew me away then. And it even, um, it blew me away more and rewatch it just leaves me stunned afterwards. I think Jonathan Glazer, one of the most compelling and fascinating working directors today, even though he only makes a film every decade at this rate. Um, but please keep on doing that because if you take that time and care to create such a perfectly fine tuned masterpiece as this film is in every single aspect, then in 10 years time, maybe we'll see him picking up Oscars. But unfortunately, I don't think he's going to pick I think this is going to pick up international feature and that's probably about it unfortunately maybe sound i'd love it i'd love to see some shocks on sunday night because i i think this film is absolute genius and i can just see myself re-watching this film and find picking every detail that he he made for this film because it's an unbelievable film in my opinion um but yeah alex i will hand it over to you yeah starting us off my number 10 is barbie I do like the passion Greta Gerwig brings to this. I like the first like 40 minutes of it, but listen, like I'm a 26 year old dude. I'm not this film's audience at the end of the day. And, you know, I think it does get a little tell on show for me, especially towards the end and like that, that middle section I really didn't love personally, but yeah, then number nine, American fiction. We just talked about it. It's, it's a good film. It's got a lot of great things to say. Just a little kind of a, uh, Ideas are better than the execution, in my opinion, a little too academia style for me. Eight Anatomy of a Fall has interesting ideas to explore. Just, you know, I'm not a courtroom. Once again, like I'm not this film's audience. I don't like courtroom dramas and I am not big on dialogue heavy films. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. So Barbie is my 53 on the year. Anatomy of a Fall is 45. American Fiction is 38. How many films have you seen? I have seen 65. And then, uh, so next two are very neck and neck. They kind of are interchangeable ranking wise, but number seven with the Oscars and number 21 on the year is the holdovers. Nice, wholesome film, like solidly directed, just solid, good watch in my opinion. 
Number six and number 20 on the year is Past Lives. I think this is a film that I was more critical of after a first watch. I really don't like talking about films until I've seen them twice. And this definitely did go up on a rewatch. And I'm, I'm someone who's more interested in places than people a lot of the time. And I like how this film is very much about places. So definitely a lot better than I gave it credit for in some of our previous episodes. It, it's a very solid film and a very impressive directorial debut. That is my number six and number 20 on the year. Number five, Yorgos Lanthimos is poor things. Yorgos is one of the most interesting directors anytime he does a film. His direction is so creative and brilliant at all times. I really do like this film a lot. It's my number 16 on the year. And, you know, the fact that it's it's this low really is a showcase of that this was a very good film year because Yorgos directed the fuck out of this one. Like, he did a great job. Number four for best picture rankings, and my four and three are also neck and neck interchangeable. But number four is Maestro. I've given it a ton of praise. I love Cooper's direction, I love the way they evolve the style of the film, and I think it's some of the most interesting storytelling of the year for sure. And yeah, I just you know, it's 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 a great film to see, also some of the best performances of the year for sure. And yeah, so that's my number four. That's my 13 on the year. My number 12 of the year and three for best picture rankings is Killers of the Flower Moon from the greatest of all time, Martin Scorsese. I thought for sure at the beginning of the year this would be my one. I It's not quite my favorite Scorsese, but it's another case of I just think his his storytelling in this is so great. And it's, it's ultra subtle compared to, you know, some of his more high. Not that his other films aren't subtle, but it's just it's a lot calmer than his more high volume, high energy storytelling. It's a lot slower paced. But every watch, like it's one you just notice new things in his storytelling and the scene juxtaposition are, are so insanely brilliant. And Scorsese really took a fresh approach to this one and, and does do a great job. It's it's not my favorite Scorsese, but it's a great film, absolutely. Number 12 on the year. Now we're getting into the only two, which are best picture nominees, which made my top 10. Number two is the zone of interest, one of the most brilliant directions, not just of this year but of any of the years recently. This is a film that I talked about films where you, you know, rewatch and notice new things. This is a film that you notice a ton of new things every rewatch. There's so many layers to this. The visual and auditory storytelling in this are brilliant and the synchronization between the two. Like, it's just, it's ultra thought provoking. It's, you know, brilliantly crafted in, in every possible way of filmmaking and, you know, it's we did a whole episode on it because there's so much more great things I could say about it than I can right now without us just taking a bunch of time to go on a tangent. So I'll, I'll just end it there. It's a brilliant film from Jonathan Glazer and uh, one of the best of the year. That is my, I believe, number five on the year. Yeah, my number five on the year. And then number one for best picture rankings and my number one on the year is Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Not even a competition. It's the best score of the year. It's the best edited, best pacing. And it's just he makes a movie about like Anatomy of a Fall. I was bored watching like the science part of the courtroom drama. Like Chris Nolan makes science interesting to listen to. And like, like I said, I've criticized dialogue a lot in this episode. This is a, pretty much a pure dialogue film. I just ranked it number one for a reason because it, Chris Nolan knows how to make it entertaining and use the score and the rhythm and the energy to, to make me interested in listening to the dialogue. And it's, it's such a, it's, it's easily his best film. It's his magnum opus. You see traits of every single one of his films prior in this film. And it's, it's like true. I think he's finally going to get his Oscar and this is the most deserving he's ever been a one. So that is easily my number one on the year and in the best picture nominees easily. Nice to see at least two of us got the correct number one in there. Wait, 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 wait. Nice to see two of got the of interest where it should be. And to get some diversity in there. Um, no, I agree. Yeah, I like but, interest in one. I have no issue with that because it's, it's, it's up there for me. Oppenheimer is going to sweep this weekend. Um, if not, then I don't know, but that's it would be crazy if it doesn't. Um, but yeah, yeah I think I've got like, and it's honestly deserved to be honest from nolan i know like i said i've i don't adore his earlier works um but i think with tenet and oppenheimer my two favorite films of his these definitely moving away from the stereotypes that a lot of people associate with him and please keep heading that direction for the love of anything please because it's working so well
and Ludwig's been cooking. Like, all due respect to Hans. Oh, Zimmer, yeah. Ever, ever since he got Ludwig, Ludwig, he's made his two best films. Yes. All due respect to Hans Zimmer. Like, Interstellar's got a great score, but I think the two best scores in all movies are Oppenheimer and Tenet, if I'm being honest. That's facts. That's yeah, facts. it's not ridiculous. I agree. And, like, I've always wanted to love Nolan. Like, I like everything he stands for with, like, practical effects, shooting on film, you know, seeing the cinematic experience and going to the theater. Like, I always want to love his films. And I just, in his early ones, I was never able to, like, truly love him to the point of putting him in my top 100. And Oppenheimer finally gave that Nolan film that, like, I could really just, like, love this film. So that was, that, it was great. Uh, to, yeah, I'm the same. This is, this, this is his masterpiece, I think, is in my top yeah, 100 definitely. as well. It's out. But he's going to do something great next, I'm sure. He's, he's still he's not, he's not that old, and he's got plenty of career left in him, so I can't wait to see what he does next. But I assume he's going to take a little bit of a break after this one. Tenet prequel or sequel, whichever way around. <laughs> is it both at the same, same time? Is both is both at the same time? <laughs> Please. I don't care what he does. Just let Logan cook, and I'm there. <laughs> True. <laughs> Yeah, but we've got we've got episodes on all these um, best picture nominees. If you didn't see any of those, go and check them out. All of them, apart from the ones we talked about today, obviously. But yeah, um, check those out if you haven't seen them. Subscribe. Let us know who or what what, what did you want to win um, best picture if you if you're watching this before the Oscars or after them. Um, and do you agree with the the best picture nominees? Um, but yeah, um, check us out next or at the weekend. We'll be watching the Oscars and see our reaction to when Oppenheimer wins everything. Yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs>